Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant. This time it's not an episode about statistics. This one's about actually physics. Maths is going to be the tool we use to talk about the physics, but this is about quantum mechanics stuff. Because this is a special episode, I'm pitching it at a level that's much higher than the general audience. If you've had an undergraduate course in quantum mechanics, you'll probably be okay. If you understand what the phrase eigenspaces of an operator or a matrix means, you'll probably be okay. So I'm doing this special episode about stuff in quantum mechanics, specifically Wigner's friend, as the title suggests, because I keep having conversations with physicists about this. I did my honours on Wigner's friend and open quantum systems, but I did it from a mathematical perspective, not to a particularly high level, because uh, I didn't have any physics background, so I couldn't really get access to that sort of stuff in a year. And uh, the Nobel Prize last year for physics went to people who did this, this research, looking at open quantum systems and what I call bell-type inequalities. We'll come to what those represent in a bit. That Nobel Prize produced some very interesting breathless reporting about the death of objective truth and reality in physics, uh, multiverses, and things of that nature. So I want to address my understanding, I suppose, primarily as a statistician more than anything else, of the results, what they represent with relation to the mathematical model and the physics, and how this kind of, this stuff about the death of objective reality really doesn't understand what's actually represented and what's going on here. Some preliminary stuff about the mathematical model. So what I care about here is that you have an observable, and this represents some measurement you care about on a system. So the ones you typically get introduced to first are position and momentum of a particle in a frictionless vacuum, if you want to be precise. There are other ones like spin of an electron, up down is a, is a typical one, energy state of electrons in electron shells. These are the sorts of things that I care about here. So an observable representing a measurable quantity on a physical system. We represent this observable as an operator. If that word's not familiar to you, then you can think matrix, but potentially infinite dimensional. The operator theory is more general than like matrix theory stuff. And, like, we have infinite dimensional results in quantum mechanics, so we do care about that. The operator stuff that I'm going to talk about is also more general than the wave equation framework that is typically taught at the undergraduate level when you deal with, like, Schrodinger's equation and things. There is an equivalence between the two. In fact, there are mathematical results that show you where that equivalent work, equivalence works in what ways. But the operator theory is a much richer representation, and I think... A, a better approach that lets you see more clearly what's going on here. So for the purpose of this talk, you can treat it as a finite dimensional matrix, because I will not be using any examples that are not finite dimensional matrices. So the values that this observable can take correspond to the eigenspaces of the operator. These are called states of the observable, and as said, they correspond to eigenspaces of the operator. So in nice cases, you have eigenspaces that correspond to eigenvalues. There are messy cases that show up. So you, often what you will get is an eigenvalue. I mean, this might be the spectral lines for a particular element or something. The eigenvalue represents the eigenspace because it's the eigenvalue corresponding to that eigenspace. And how it manifests physically in the case of like the spectrum of hydrogen or something is it's the wavelength of the light for a line. Pure states are uh, single eigenspaces. Mixed states are linear combinations of eigenspaces. We'll talk about the mixed states a bit more because they are really central to this whole thing. From a kind of physics perspective, these are also termed superposition states. So these are special linear combinations of pure states. So let's say we have an electron. Its states are spin up and spin down, then a superposition state would be alpha times the spin up vector plus beta times the spin down vector, such that the absolute value of alpha squared plus the absolute value of beta squared is equal to 1. This weighting, this gives you a probability distribution in the fact that this is the probability of spin up, and this is the probability of spin down. So already we bring in that kind of statistical, that probabilistic structure, and this is what kind of 
dragged me into this stuff in the first place, is it's the overlapping material that came out of my pure mouth stuff and the statistics side as well. Now, when we come to actually look at a quantum system and we take a measurement, we observe whether or not the system, in this case our electron, is in state spin up or state spin down. So we're measuring whether it is in one of these eigenspaces, even though we have this superposition state that gives us a probabilistic result. So what that means is we don't know which spin up or spin down we're going to see. All we know is that we're going to get one of them. That's important because we do only observe one of them, even though you have this mixed state. And over a long enough set of experiments with the same weights, you will get a proportion of your outcomes roughly correspond, or if you're big enough sample size, infinite sample size, corresponding to the probability of each. So this is why we can refer to them as probabilistic structures. This is what that kind of mixed state or superposition state represents. The problem is, we don't really understand what it means to measure something. This is broadly termed the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. I think it's particularly a problem for the wave mechanics view of things. I'm going to treat measurement as a special type of quantum interaction. And this is one of the reasons that I find the wave, wave equation treatment kind of lackluster, because it doesn't allow you to encode interactions very easily. What I mean by that is you have this system you care about, let's say it's an electron, and you have a measurement instrument that's going to tell you what state that electron is in. The measurement instrument is also a quantum object. We don't typically treat it as such because it's hard when you do and it gets messy. And this leads us to the, the broad topic of an open quantum system. I'm just going to say this is broadly about interactions and that measurement is a special interaction. One of the reasons that I'm uh, big into open quantum systems, aside from the fact that they're kind of addictive to think about, to be perfectly honest, is that closed quantum systems, a quantum system that's not interacting with anything, doesn't really exist. And because measurement is an interaction, as soon as you measure it, it stops being a closed system anyway. Like the results that we see for things like spectral lines of atom like atomic spectra and whatever, while we can see those atomic spectral lines, the process of actually getting that data is not a closed system process. And the same is true of our spin electron, right? The measurement is an open system. You're introducing an interaction when you do that. And that is very, very rarely modeled in any sort of quantum mechanics, at least taught at the undergraduate level. The quantum computing people kind of have to care about it because they actually have to do these measurements all the time. Uh, my brother does quantum computing stuff. So they have ways of dealing with this and errors and all this sort of stuff that come out of that interaction in the open systems. But those are adaptations to the open quantum system behavior. They're not so much modeling the open quantum systems themselves because that's hard. And the, honestly, the math isn't there yet. I'll talk about that more later. So our most basic model for an open quantum system is a thought experiment called Wigner's Friend. Uh, this is one of these sort of twee thought experiments where you talk about people doing things and you actually on the bench top do it with like electrons and whatever and equipment. So Wigner's Friend is in a lab with a mixed state system. So this is your combination alpha up plus beta down, right? Representing this mixed state, this probabilistic sort of system. Wigner is outside looking in at the combined system of the lab and the electron. Let's call it electron. Wigner is observing the interaction here between the lab and the electron. Wigner's friend, the guy in the lab, person in the lab, is the one doing with the actual quote unquote closed system. So there is some idealism to this, which is why your experimental results are always messy. But you can still do stuff with this as a model for behavior. Okay, now I'm going to write down some maths. A is going to be the system with mixed state alpha up plus beta down. I know I'm not using brackets and whatever, you'll live. B is Wigner's friend watching the system, I guess slash the lab, interacting with A. How we represent this mathematically is we take the system A, we use what's called a tensor product, with B. If you're not used to tensor products, 
just take it to be a special kind of multiplication that can encode interactions and correlations. And importantly, uh, that expands the dimensions. So this is a 2D system. This is a 4D system of Wigner's friend observing the electron. And you go from 2 to 4D by multiplying. When we introduce another one of these, we're going to go from 4 dimensions to 4 dimensions to 16 dimensions. I'm not going to do the calculations. I have done them in my honours. They suck. Now, on this level, the weirdness that you get is that Wigner's friend in the lab can make an observation on this quantum system, say, hey, I've made an observation, but to Wigner, there will still be a superposition of states, because what we're seeing at the A tensor B level is alpha up tensor observed up plus, and let's be clear, that's, that's the vector we care about here, beta down tensor observed down. This is a linear combination of basis vectors, but the basis vectors here are different to what they were before, because we've got up and observed up, down and observed down. So what I mean when I say that Wigner's friend can take an observation, so Wigner's friend looks at this alpha up plus beta down system and says, I've observed one of these. So I hate this terminology because it's wrong and bad, but if you're in a Copenhagen person, you would say that that waveform has collapsed. But at the interaction level, at this A tensor B level, where Wigner is watching the lab interact with the system, that has not had a waveform collapse. That's still in this superposition state. And that's very strange. I don't entirely understand how the maths corresponds to the physical system. I'm not an experimentalist. And uh, the way I talk about this stuff is going to reflect the fact that I have no fucking idea what's going on in the experiments. But the maths of this, as I have written here, excusing notation, shall we say, that's what's happening on this particular level. And Wigner's friend is interesting precisely because it does encode that relationship between the interaction of these quantum systems and what you can actually observe. All right, we're going to make this more complicated. And this is how we get to Bell type inequalities, which is with Wigner's friend and friends. So in this case, we're going to have two lots of the Wigner's friend experiment, and we're going to entangle them. So we have our A tensor B, which is Wigner watching his friend, and his friend is observing a spin. And we have C tensor D. Same setup, but this is going to be Pauli instead. So watching his friend observe spin. We then have the combined system. A tensor B tensor C tensor D. I don't have to put brackets around this because it's an associative operation. So each lab gets half of an entangled pair with total spin zero. So, if one of these electrons is measured, it will have spin up, the other electron will then have spin down, or vice versa. You still have the probabilistic structure here. Entanglement is really a, a very strong correlational structure. That, that's how I, my stats brain, kind of think about it. And I think that's kind of useful when looking at this sort of stuff, because you can talk about when correlation does and does not occur. I'm going to draw a diagram of this. So we have, up the top, A tensor B tensor C tensor D, which is our entangled pair, then we split it up. So on the first side we have A tensor B, second side we have C tensor D. Okay, so we've separated our electron pairs and sent one to each of these labs. Now, at this stage, will normal entanglement stuff applies. If you measure on A, you will see, say, spin up, then you, if, when you measure on B, you will see spin down. If when you measure on A, you see spin down, on B, you will see spin up, and they have the probabilities corresponding to the mixed state, so half of each, typically, because it's spin zero in total. That's fine. That makes sense. That's not where we see the weird shit. Then, Pauli and his mate do something. They do a rotation. 
So in spin terms, it's literally a rotation of using polarized light or something. It's a phase transition, I think. Again, not an experimentalist. The references to the experimental results are in the notes below. Then we have C tensor D again. If the usual rules of entanglement apply in this context, then A and B and C and D should be able to observe that up-down correlation. This is what Bell type inequalities say. So your Bell type inequality says if everything still works and for the fine definition of what that means we'll get to it in a second we see and here is where i'm going to gloss over an awful lot of maths basically what we're doing is we make an observation of a bunch of different things add them up one of them has a minus sign there's always a fucking minus sign and the sum of stuff is less than or equal to 2. If you really want more information, look at the references below or go and look up Bell type inequalities. The reason that this is interesting is that this gets violated. We actually observe start this sum of stuff greater than 2 to a reasonable hypothesis test, result, estimate, etc., etc., for suitable rotation. Okay, violation of a Bell type inequality is usually taken to mean that what's called hidden variables don't exist. So this is an interpretation of this inequality, which is usually like, no, really, this is quantum behavior. It's not classical. That's what's going on here. Because there is no hidden variable, which means that there is no actual honest truth going on in the background that you can, that's hidden from you, but you might access. In a classical case, there would be. In this case, there isn't. This is where you get the panic about the death of objective reality. Because on first reading, what that means is relative truth. These are observing different universes, and that's a bit of a problem because they're in the same room on the same lab bench. I find the interpretation of this stuff kind of... Um, I understand why people do it. I don't think we know enough to try and impose interpretation, as we're going to see in a second. What I interpret this as, and write it down here, so a violation of Bell type inequalities represents disagreement about what was observed. Okay, this is measurable on the benchtop. As I mentioned, the experimental results were first seen in the 80s. I think there was a report I found when I was doing my honors from a, a Soviet physics journal talking about experiments on Wigner's friend. Uh, Wigner had some very strange ideas about human consciousness in relation to this. I don't think those are true, but th that, uh, those results were kind of framed in terms of this. The more recent stuff was from like 2018 and such. References are below, but this result is extremely consistent. It's happened for generations of physicists that have kept finding this and kept going, fuck, what do we do about it? I want to look at the maths in a little bit more detail now and what that representation tells us is happening. So our observables are operators corresponding to the system's a and C at the most basic level. That's what we are observing. So these are the spin of those electrons, right? If we come back up here to our diagram, we actually take a further step. Just come down to C here. We come down to A here. From a mathematical perspective, this is an operation we call a partial trace. That may not mean anything to the rest of you, but just know that that is how we go from a, a tensor product of these spaces to a smaller space. So we have a partial trace here, and then a partial trace here again. I'm hiding all of that because I don't want to talk about it. But at the bottom level, we are observing these systems A and C, and we are asking if they agree. Well, what we observe on them is that up and down are eigenspaces of the operators representing the observables. That's just the maths that's going behind it, right? Until rotation, these behave as expected, uh, by which I mean Bell-type inequalities holds. After rotation, don't. There's a mathematical structure going on here. Until rotation, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this level. So uh, A tensor B, C tensor D operators commute. After rotation, don't commute. Okay, so now I'm very definitely talking about the mathematical representation. 
And I want to make a very careful distinction between the mathematical model that we use to represent the physical system and the physical system itself. The mathematical structure is that we have operators that don't commute. The physical structure is that our observations of the spin on these systems do not agree in a manner that we count as violating Bell-type inequalities. From maths, we actually know something about what it means for operators to commute. In fact, I'm just going to write this as a theorem. Commuting operators have a common eigenbasis. So what that means is that the eigenstates, the eigenspaces, are the same for commuting operators. This is an extension of what you might have seen in second year linear algebra, where you can prove it for matrices. This is true for matrices as well. If you have two matrices and they commute, they will have a shared eigenspace. Because for our operators, for our observables, the states correspond to eigenspaces, what this means is that commuting observables have compatible states. Because they're, they're observing the same sort of thing. An extension on this, which is true, is that in fact operators commute if and only if they have a shared eigenbasis. So operators... Let's call them uh, M and N commute if and only if they have shared eigenbasis. Exactly the same thing applies to observables. If you have non-commuting observables, you do not have a shared set of possible things you can observe, a shared set of states. So if you have non-commuting observables, you are not measuring compatible things. This is the result comes from the maths, right? This is what the math theory tells us. But we can interpret that, eh, I'm going to shake your ground, in a physical capacity to mean that if two physical things that you are trying to measure, if they have non-commuting observables, they are measuring fundamentally incompatible information. So for your position and momentum, they are non-commuting observables. And the way that incompatibility manifests is that if you measure one, you introduce uncertainty to the other in the form of a, a distribution, and the same the other way around. The rotation of this system in the CD side breaks commutivity with the observable from AB. That means that you no longer have that shared eigenbasis that you can actually get at. There's no longer compatible information between the two. From a like distribution theory standpoint, what it means to have a compatible eigenbasis is that you have what's called a joint probability distribution, which means that in combination, you have a probability distribution that can describe both sets of outcomes. If you do not have a compatible eigenbasis because you don't have commuting variables, you don't have a joint probability distribution. This is what the violation of the Bell-type inequality is. It's a representation mathematically of the loss of shared information, which is the common eigenbasis and the joint distribution that corresponds to that. And to me, this is the only way to understand this result. The measured violation of this Bell-type inequality is evidence that whatever we represent as non-commutative behavior corresponds to physical behavior that is really there and is about the loss of shared information. If you have something that breaks commutivity, you can no longer measure compatible facts. And that's weird. But it shouldn't be a surprise, because that is kind of the fundamental structure of quantum mechanics. We built the maths to represent that behavior. We built commu- we, not me obviously, but like the people who came before me who actually did the hard work, built the maths in the operator theory and whatever else to represent this behavior as non-commutivity. This is why I keep having these conversations with physicists, right? Because I came to this from the mathematics. I came to this saying, you have these observables, the states are the eigenspaces, you have operators. When operators do not commute, you don't have a shared eigenbasis. Okay, why would you have compatible information there? Physicists kind of came from it the other way, of course, because they're the ones that built this stuff. But that relationship between the mathematical structure that I see, which you know, it tells its own story in many ways, 
and the consistent results with the physical processes that it was built to describe, it is both very interesting and slightly freaky. When I say this isn't a surprise to me, I'm not saying that, like, the Nobel for this stuff wasn't deserved or whatever else. I mean, they've done so much genuinely impressive work expanding on this stuff and showing more complex systems and things. My problem is with the breathless articles about the death of objective reality and whatever else, because they don't really recognize the level that this operates on. To get to this, to see this non-commutative behavior in practice, you have to really isolate stuff. We're talking about results in a lab. If you have interference, by which I mean interactions with other stuff, that stuff's your experiment up, and you don't get good results. This is also why you get measurement error in your results, right? And why you have to do statistical tests, because it's never as straightforward and your machine breaks and so on and so on. At the level that we live, everything commutes. So we have to build these kind of extremely isolated quantum experiments in order to observe the weirdness. And because we know that we can observe quantum stuff that does commute, if we don't do this rotation, this system commutes. So we know that the non-commutative stuff and the commutative stuff are two parts of the same system because you have kind of a more general theory that can describe both of them. It's right here. It's not impossible to think about a situation where you have quantum systems with non-commutative behavior, we observe them, and quantum systems with commutative behavior up to the macro scale. And here is where I get kind of um, vibes-based and uh, start impinging upon the experimentalists. To me, the interesting stuff here isn't the consequences of non-commutivity, which is like the lack of a joint probability distribution here. I am sure that more consequences of non-commutivity will be found, but that is kind of the fundamental behavior that makes quantum mechanics, in this context, more general than classical mechanics, because classical mechanics is the commuting case. What is more interesting to me is the question of what does or does not commute we can construct observables mathematically that do not commute, and then go and measure them and see if that's actually true. This gives us access to some very interesting experimental questions. Now, I'm not going to do this because I'm not a physicist or an experimentalist, but if you can construct something that doesn't commute, that represents an actual thing that you could observe in the world, you can go and find out. I am also really interested in how interaction behaves with commutivity. What we have here in this rotation, this is really an interaction. It's an interaction between the electron, or wave of light or whatever, and the thing that does the rotation. In theory, I should probably be tacking on something else here. Let's call it F. That's not quite how it works, though, because we've been very, very selective about the, the transformation that we've chosen. And a rotation is one that doesn't introduce new stuff. Mathematically, it's a unitary operation. Um, that's just the technical term. Physically, we've picked something that doesn't interfere with it so much that we really screw it up. All that we can see as a change here is the rotation of those basis vectors for the C tensor D system. In general, though, we don't really have a good theory for how interactions work. Scattering theory is kind of where that's at at the moment, but that's really hard and it's not fully developed. And it's still kind of limited by the waveform model that it usually takes, because although that's equivalent to the operator model, the operator model is a bit more powerful. In, in this particular case, our rotation is actually a continuous one, right? When you don't rotate at all, you have your joint probability distribution. Theoretically, if you have any rotation that diverges those two eigenspaces, you are violating commutivity. But you're only violating commutivity a little bit if you rotate a little bit. Then you have your maximum violation, which is what you actually look for in the experimental side because it's the easiest thing to observe. And then as you rotate further and further, you come back around to corresponding eigenbases. Well, that's the theory anyway. None of the experimental stuff that I've seen has really tried to do that, but it's interesting to think about, and I think that there might be avenues for further experimental results there. In summary of all of this, Bell-type inequalities are a statement about whether or not you actually have shared information at the quantum level, but that doesn't mean in the, like, multiverse sense. It means that what you are measuring is fundamentally incompatible 
if you have a violation of bell type inequalities, which means that you have non-commuting observables. I would be very interested to see further investigation of this stuff, which asks questions like, how non-commuting do you have to be in order to get a, a violation of the bell type inequality in order to get like really unmeasurable information, like really not shared information. Due to measurement error, you're really not just observing whether or not you're in a particular subspace, you've got some error around it. So I think that maybe a lot of the quote-unquote commutative behavior that we actually see might be not quite as commutative as we think, but a commutative within measurement error. So that may be one of the ways that we see kind of classical, I'm making air quotes here, behavior in quantum systems is that it's close enough to commutative that we can still make joint probability distributions meaningful up to measurement error. That's like me throwing stuff at the wall and I don't know what sticks because I'm thinking from a, about it from a statistical standpoint. But who knows, we may in the next like 10 or 15 years see actual experimental results along those lines. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you're not too angry with me if you're a physicist. At the very least, I hope that this has given you an interpretation of these bell type inequality experiments that's meaningful and useful. If you like this, please subscribe, particularly to the Patreon. I would love some money for doing this stuff. We have a lot of other content around other statistical things of me ranting. Go check it out, and thank you once again.